in the 1920s, Joe the Boss Mazaria cemented his control over the Morello Gang, which would eventually become the Genovese crime family. In 1928, his primary boss rival in New York City, Salvador de Quila, was killed, and Mazaria became one of the most important figures in the Italian-American Mafia. But of course, being on top puts a target on your back, and by 1930 a new boss was arising who was intent on taking Mazaria on. And the war that followed was not a typical mob war, but one that resulted in transforming virtually the entire leadership and very nature of organized crime in America, resulting in one of the most significant events in American mob history, the creation of the commission. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In the early years of the 20th century, Italian organized crime syndicates fought amongst each other over territory and disagreements. These groups were often defined by ethnicity. There were Irish and Jewish gangs, but among Italians there were gangs from Calabria, Naples, and of course, Sicily. Mazzaria was an old-school mafia captain, born in Sicily in 1886. He came to the U.S. when he was 16 and quickly joined the Morello Gang, which was active in Harlem and Little Italy. He spent time in jail for burglary. By the end of the 1910s, was in a struggle with Salvador de Quila for power in New York. In 1922, Mazzaria became head of the Morello Gang and survived an assassination attempt where two bullets tore through his straw hat, but he was unharmed. He earned the reputation as the man who could dodge bullets. He continued to rise in power until Daquila's murder in 1928. Masseria was named Capo di Capi, or Boss of All Bosses, that year and worked on centralizing all mob activity under his own influence. One anonymous detective said in the New York Times that Masseria was bigger than Al Capone. He pressured other gangs for monetary tribute and bullied other gangs to follow his wishes. In 1930, he forced Niccolo Shiro, who led his own crime family, to step down over a transgression. This fateful action would ultimately lead to Salvatore Maranzano taking over the Shiro crime family. Maranzano was born in Castellamare del Golfo in Sicily, where he became associated with Sicilian mafioso Don Vito Ferro. Ferro had been active in New York City crime for years and is usually considered to be responsible for the murder of Joseph Petrosino head of the New York Police Department's Italian squad and the subject of another episode of The History Guy, though he was never convicted. By 1930, Don Vito hoped to take over American crime and sent Maranzano to accomplish the task. Unfortunately for the Don, he was arrested in 1930 and sentenced to life in prison by Benito Mussolini's fascist government, and the Don would never see freedom again. That left Maranzano free to do his work without any commands from Sicily. Maranzano established a legitimate real estate business while simultaneously building a bootlegging business under prohibition. He also became involved in prostitution and narcotic smuggling. After Shiro was ousted, Maranzano became the head of the family and he headed out for the so-called boss of bosses, Joe Mazzaria. The war became known as the Castellamarisi War thanks to Maranzano's connection to Castellamare del Golfo. His faction became known as the Castellamare faction. The first shots were fired by Mazzaria. In February 1930, Mazzaria had Gitano Reina, boss of the Reina family, killed because Reina had become supporting Maranzano and Mazzaria was acting to protect several of his allies. In May, Gaspar Malazzo, a high-ranking member of the Detroit Mafia, was killed on Mazzaria's orders, allegedly because of Malazzo's failure to support him in a dispute with the Chicago outfit. On July 15th, another Shiro leader was shot outside his garage. Mazzaria was acting to stamp out what he saw as a challenge to his domination. Maranzano, now in charge and supported by Reina's gang, retaliated by killing Giuseppe Morello, original founder of the Morello gang and one of Mazzaria's top lieutenants. The Reina gang had controlled an ice distribution racket which Mazzaria had seized, putting his own man in charge. The Reina members murdered that man on September 9th. Mazzaria traded another blow, killing a Castellamare ally in Chicago. As the war continued into 1930, the tide started to shift in favor of Maranzano, and gangs that had been loyal to Mazzaria started to shift over and give their loyalty to Maranzano, which was blurring the battle lines. But while it appeared that this was a fight between Maranzano and Mazzaria, there was an undercurrent of a different conflict that crossed those battle lines. This mob war was not just between two bosses, but between generations. The old guard Sicilian leadership were called the Mustache Peets, mostly older Italian men who had immigrated to the U.S. as adults and had significant ties to the Mafia in Italy. The Peets wanted to maintain Sicilian criminal traditions and largely worked with and exploited other Italians. 
Some of these mafia leaders only wanted to work with men who had roots in the same Italian villages in Sicily. Opposed to them were the Young Turks, mostly younger Mafia members who had grown up in the U.S. and were interested in expanding Mafia efforts to work with non-Italian gangs and criminal activities. The Young Turks were more interested in money than Sicilian tradition and saw the war as a costly and unnecessary diversion. The Turks were most prominently led by Charles Lucky Luciano, who was a captain in Mezzeria's gang. Many future mob bosses aligned themselves with the faction, which included Joseph Joe Bananas Bonanno, Maranzano's protege, as well as Carlo Gambino, Tommy Lucchesi, and later co-founder of Murder, Inc., Albert Anastasia. Maranzano's strategy was working and Mazzaria's power was waning. He even ordered his men to stop carrying weapons when police appealed to him directly to stop the violence. With the tide turning against Mazzaria, Luciano allegedly entered into negotiation with the Castella Maurizi. Maranzano agreed to end the war if Luciano would arrange for Mazzaria's murder. I'm looking forward to a peaceful Easter, Maranzano allegedly told the conspirators. On April 15, 1931, Mazzaria, bodyguards, and possibly Luciano himself went to lunch at a Coney Island seafood restaurant run by Gerardo Scarpato. Exactly what happened that day is still unclear. Contemporary news reports had no clue who was involved. What exactly happened is now a matter of legend, and the truth is unknown. Scarpato was conspicuously absent on a walk, according to later questioning, and no restaurant workers were in the room. What is known is that at least two gunmen entered the restaurant and fired at Mazzaria's turned back. Twenty rounds were fired and at least five hit the man who could dodge bullets, including one in the head. It's not certain who pulled the trigger, although later reports would suggest it could have been Albert Anastasia, or Vita Genovese, or Joe Adonis, or Bugsy Siegel. Some papers speculated that Al Capone had ordered the job, but that's unlikely. The New York Times reported racket chief slain by gangster gunfire and that the boss was shot mysteriously. Many reported that police were concerned the killing would cause an outbreak of gang warfare that will exceed anything the city has ever known. Police seemed to know nothing definite of the crime. They didn't know who had been dining with Mazaria on the day of the attack, and while they found coats as well as two guns near the restaurant and three more in the abandoned getaway car, there were no witnesses who could describe the shooters. Luciano was brought in for questioning, but had an alibi, and when detectives arrived, they found that Scarpato was standing over the body. Allegedly clutched in Mazzaria's left hand was a brand new ace of diamonds, although the card may have been planted. Maranzano began immediately restructuring the American Mafia. He redistributed all the Italian gangs in New York City into five crime families, the predecessors of the Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, Genovese, and Lucchesi families. He distributed their territories, the rackets. He created an organizational structure that all reported up to him, the new boss of bosses. But there remained a significant piece of the war that was unresolved. Maranzano was considered one of the mustache peats, and while he may have been more forward-thinking than Mazzaria, Luciano and his associates were working towards even bigger goals. By September of 1931, only five months after Mazzaria's death, Maranzano realized that Luciano was a threat. He ordered a hit on Luciano, who was warned beforehand. On September 10th, Maranzano invited Luciano and Vito Genovese to come to his office in the New York Central Building. Certain that it was a ruse, Luciano acted first. Four Jewish gangsters arrived in Maranzano's office, claiming to be government agents. They disarmed the boss's bodyguards and then stabbed Maranzano before shooting him, leaving the office looking like a slaughterhouse, according to the New York Daily News. At least two witnesses were left, but exactly who the team of assailants were is, again, uncertain. This murder began what Mafia members called the Night of the Sicilian Vespers, a reference to a 13th century Sicilian uprising supposedly a mass purge by Luciano of threats and members of the old guard. Two more Maranzano allies were found dead a few days later, and several other prominent Mafia members were killed or disappeared in the immediate aftermath. While there was a lot of talk in the press, and the purge inspired a notable scene in the classic Francis Ford Coppola movie The Godfather, there was in fact no great purge that night. Luciano had now positioned himself as the most powerful crime boss in the country. Instead of declaring himself boss of all bosses, given the fate of the last two claimants to that title, he abolished the title and began building the modern mafia. Instead, he created the Commission, a governing body for organized crime in the United States. Luciano hoped to maintain control and influence over all organized crime in the country using this kind of board of directors system. Perhaps most importantly, the Commission was meant to mediate conflict between families and put profit first, thereby avoiding any repeat of the Castillo-Marisi War. The commission consisted of seven bosses, 
the leaders of the five New York families, Chicago outfit boss Al Capone, and the leader of the Buffalo family, Stefano Magadino, Luciano, was made chairman. Joe Bonanno, who took over Maranzano's family, wrote in his autobiography that they revised the old custom of looking towards one man, one supreme leader, for advice in the settling of disputes, distributing power specifically to stabilize the entire criminal operation. The first test of the system came a few years later, in 1935, when the commission ordered Dutch Schultz not to murder special prosecutor Thomas Dewey, arguing that the assassination would bring a firestorm of law enforcement retribution on the mob. When Schultz refused to stop, the commission had Schultz killed before he could move on Dewey. Though the much-reported Night of Sicilian Vespers is overstated and really more of a myth, still the clear winners of the castilla Morisi War, which ended up killing both Maranzano and Mazaria, were the young Turks who took over control of the five families and began a new era of organized crime, a foundation for mob activity in the coming decades. Luciano also lowered the walls when it came to working with non-Sicilian criminals. Some of his closest allies were Meyer Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, both Jewish. The new era would define what Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver later called a sinister conspiracy, an underground criminal organization that could evade law enforcement. Of course, the commission didn't provide perfect protection from the law, and in 1936, Luciano himself was convicted of pandering and sent to prison, and eventually deported. In 1985, the heads of all five families would be put on trial in what was called the Mafia Commission Trial. The commission also didn't end all internal violence, either. In 1963, Bonanno hatched a plot to assassinate rival members of the commission, although the plot was foiled when its targets were warned. But the years of violence and bickering that were characterized by the violent castilla Morisi War were over, and a new mafia, perhaps a uniquely American one, had arisen. The war has been fictionalized and popularized in books, in film, in television, like The Godfather and Mobsters and Boardwalk Empire, as Americans continue to be fascinated with the dark history of America's underworld. Mob history like this and many other stories and artifacts are stored in Las Vegas in the historic former U.S. Post Office and Courthouse, now the Mob Museum, the National Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement. You can learn more at themobmuseum.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.